Your commandments are not burdensome because everyone who has been born of God breaks the spell of the world that makes them hard. That blinding, deceptive, enslaving spell cast over the world from the world. Broken because of the new birth. So Father, I pray now that you would cause the new birth to happen in those who are not yet born again by the living and abiding word that will break through what I say. Leave none downtown or north. Leave none unregenerate and hell-bound. Come, speak through me, I pray. Keep me faithful to your word, humbled underneath it, not above it, not beside it. I ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming toward the end of this series. Not at the end yet. I reckon another four or five weeks. But we're coming toward the end. I can see the end. I know what the end looks like now. About 11 or 12 messages into this series on the new birth. What remains is that we focus on the effects of the new birth. The evidences that it has happened or the signs that it has happened. And to do this, we will turn to the book of the Bible that is almost entirely devoted to that question, namely 1 John. I have a book in my library at home entitled Tests of Life. It's a commentary on 1 John. So that's the title of the commentary on 1 John, Tests of Life, Evidences of Life, Signs of Life, means that this book is written, I think that's a good title, this book is written mainly to help believers know that they're born again. So a lot of you are in that condition. You've come to me. We've prayed together. This series has shaken you up. You've never heard anything quite like it before, and it, when new categories are brought into your brain, they shake you up, and you wonder, whoa, I haven't thought of myself in those terms, so since I haven't thought of myself in those terms, am I not there? That's a common issue wherever the fullness of Bible teaching is, is taught. And it's a good thing to be shaken up like that, and then with help of Bible and Holy Spirit to make your way to a restful, sweet, deep assurance of salvation. And that's why 1 John is written. Now, so here's the way we're going to go at this. We're going to do mainly overview of 1 John in this message. And at the end, tack on about six or eight minutes of exposition of verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5 to send us toward next time. So it's mainly overview. Don't get frustrated that I didn't deal with all five of these verses. I'm not planning to. You have to read something before a sermon. And so I choose text sometimes and sometimes deal with a lot of it and sometimes with a little bit of it. And this time it's going to be a little bit of it. So I hope you will be as affected as I am by the totality of 1 John. Just knowing that 1 John is there, being what it is, affects me. And I want you to see the totality and see if it can be built into your life and have the effect that it has had on me and, and I think millions of people throughout the centuries who have seen it. So the first thing we're going to do is ask why he wrote the book and let him tell us because he tells us about eight times why he wrote the book. And uh, you could sum it up 
probably in, in fewer, but instead of my trying to condense it, let's just look at all eight of them, and I'll just tick them off, make a brief comment as we go. What I would suggest, if, if you've got your own Bible in your hand w- with a pencil, I, I don't like to write with a pen in my Bible, but some people do, it's okay. Pen or pencil, I would put um, either a P for purpose or A for aim by each of these eight places, if I were you. That's, I'd want to be able to just glance at the book and say, why is this here? And look at eight verses and say, oh, that's why it's here. That's the effect it's supposed to have on me. Number one, first, I'll take them in the order that they come. First John 1, 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John is an unabashed Christian hedonist. And I say that without the slightest effort to be funny or cute. I mean it with blood earnestness. He is an unabashed Christian hedonist, meaning he's writing this book so that when its effects come to pass in these loved ones, his joy will be complete. And you'll see what his goals are and why that is a loving passion. I'll tell you in general, it is most loving of you to be happy in the happiness of others. It is even more loving of you to be happy in the eternal happiness of others. It is even more happy and loving of you to be happy in the eternal happiness of others when they are confident that they are eternally happy. And that's what this book is for. Why wouldn't he want to be happy in their happiness? So he is a Christian hedonist. That is a person who's hard after his own joy in God, in others. Number two, 1 John 2, 1. Second chapter, first verse, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now he's hoping, therefore, that what he's writing here will help them not sin. That's so wonderful that there are books in the Bible, all of them namely, that are designed to help us not sin. And isn't it good that one of his strategies for helping you not sin is to tell you immediately, failure does not disqualify you from the assurance of eternal life. Isn't that the point of the second verse? If anyone does sin, we have an advocate. The Father, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So one of his strategies, you've got to think this one through because some people would go just the opposite. They would think verse 2 ruins verse 1. doesn't work that way. People who feel hopeless in their sin, sin more. People who feel like there's the hope of forgiveness for what they did or did this morning feel maybe tomorrow I can make a little progress. But if they don't think there's any verse 2, they're not going to verse 1. Number 3, 1 John 2, 12 and 13. This one has three purposes in it, so I'm combining three as I read. One, or number three, I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Number four, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Number five, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Now, the point of all those three is I'm writing to real, live, genuine believers. I feel good about you. So don't think the Bible was written because churches were total failures. These folks were doing what he wanted them to do, and he wrote to them anyway. Make his joy complete and to keep them from sin. Number six, 1 John 2, 21. Chapter 2, verse 21. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Just the same thing as last time. I'm writing to you because I feel so good about where you are and I'm eager for you to stay there and not get swept away because number seven, look at number seven, 1 John 2, 26, chapter 2, verse 26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. 
You feel a little more urgency now. It's not because the church has gone haywire. It's because there are people coming into the church or rising up within the church saying things that will make them go haywire if he doesn't protect them. Don't ever think, Christian, you're beyond the need for warning. I need to be warned that certain trajectories of my life could ruin me. This book is written to Christians who are making it. And and he sees threats. He sees clouds on the horizon rising in these deceivers in verse 26. They're in America today. They're in the church today. Number eight, the last one, 1 John 5.13. 5.13, so all the way to the last chapter. Chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe. That's who he's writing to, believers. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, that you're born again. You get eternal life when you're born again. That's what happens to you when you're born again. You were dead, now you're alive. New birth is in the middle, and now you have life. And and he says, you might not be assured of this. That's comforting, isn't it? I mean, be honest. You wake up in the morning, you don't feel like a Christian. You feel guilty. You're not sure. If you think you've never been there, you're not honest. And I'm thankful that this verse and this book is in the book. I'm writing these things that you who believe, you can really believe, and then you can know. So assurance is an up and down thing. It's an up and down thing. You lose sleep for three days in a row, I doubt that you'll be assured that you're saved. It's a scary thing to be a human being with the brain and a soul and a body all so vulnerable. It's a scary thing to be a human being who will live forever in hell or in heaven, have it hang on the new birth and faith, but not on assurance. I write these things to you that you may know, and that's the main burden of the book. So let me sum them up. The point of this book, the aim of of this man in these eight statements, I'm writing to you because, number one, you're true believers. I love you. And you're with me. We're the children of God. We're having fellowship with each other and with the Father. We are on the same page. We're believers. Number two, and there are deceivers coming. And they're starting to say things in the church about Christ and about sin. Number three, I want you to be rock solid confident that you're a Christian in the face of this deception because they're going to shake you up who hasn't been shaken up by some PhD, who hasn't been shaken up by a book like Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus, or, or the new one that just came out a week ago called God's Problem and how he went to Moody and went to Wheaton and became, went to Princeton and became a pastor and, and threw it all away and now doesn't call himself a Christian anymore. And he's writing books to recruit out of Christianity all stupid people like us who think that Jesus really said what the Bible says he said and that suffering can be explained in some way. That's tragic. You should pray for Bart Ehrman, University of North Carolina. Pray for him. I'd love to see him come back. It's my alma mater. There are deceivers in the world, and their books are selling at number 18 at Amazon. And fourth, he doesn't want them to be drawn away into sin. And fifth, if he, if, he, if he could achieve all of that by the power of the Spirit and the inspired Word, his joy would be really full. So that's, that's what he's up to. Now, let's consider one more overview before we turn to the, the text. And this overview is to look at the tests of life. So one book is called The Tests of Life. 
First John is just filled with tests of life. That is, evidences that you have life. Divine, supernatural, spirit, wrought life. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You get touched with that electric bolt of the spirit through the word, and there's life. How do you know that there's life? And he gives you 11 tests. Now, I think they can all be reduced to two. But I'm not going to do that this time. I'm just going to read all 11 of them, and you can decide what the two would be. All right? So here we go again, taking them. The first one in each group will be the order they come, and, but I, I have put them in groups. Number one. And here, if you were doing the pencil thing, I would put maybe S in the margin for sign. So you got all the P's or A's. Now, what are the signs of being born again? And there's 11 plus, and you can put an S beside those. 1 John 2, 3 and 4. By this we know that we have come to know Him. That's a very strange way of talking. (laughs) Isn't it? We know we've come to know. So you can know him and not be sure that you know him. And he wants you to be sure that you know him. Isn't that strange? That's just so good. Got to get inside that and just get in front of the mirror of the word, be honest, and say, now what, what, what is that for me? Because I think what you'll find is something very helpful for your soul. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's number one. He says it again in chapter 3, verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. So number one, those who are born of God keep his commandments. Number two, those who are born of God walk as Christ walked. First John 2, 5, second half of the verse. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we know we're in him if we walk the way Christ walked. Number three. Those who are born of God don't hate others, but love them. Now, there are one, two, three, four verses, at least, that say that. First one, 1 John 2, 9. 1 John 2, verse 9, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness still. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. You don't love your brothers, you're dead. Number three, in this number three, the third text on number three, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And the last text on this one, 1 John 4, 20. 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Number four, those who are born of God don't love the world. Not the people in the world, but the world system the stuff that it offers you as a way to be satisfied without God. 1 John 2.15, second half of the verse. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Number five, those who are born of God confess the Son and receive or have the Son. 1 John 2, 23, no one denies the Son 
No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John 4.15, same point. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in Him and He in God. Third text on this point, 1 John 5.12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's exactly last week's text. To as many as received him, he gave power to become children of God. You got life in you from God as a child because you've received the Son. But if you, if you reject the Son, you don't have life. Number six, those who are born of God practice righteousness. 1 John 2, 29. 229. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Number seven, those who are born of God don't make a practice of sinning. We will be sure to come back with this one because it's so controversial. 1 John 3, 6, 1 John 3, 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has seen him or known him. Don't fail to put an S by that just because it looks hard. 1 John 3, 9 and 10, just four verses, three verses later, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 1 John 5.18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who has been born, but he who was born of God protects him. That's Christ. And the evil does not touch him. Number eight, those who are born of God possess the Spirit of God. 1 John 3, 24, second half of the verse And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given to us. Hmm. That's very much like Paul's witness of the Holy Spirit. The the Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. And this says, by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he's given to us. Or chapter 4, verse 13 By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The Holy Spirit evidently is an evidence. Not just something that needs an evidence. Number nine, those who are born of God listen submissively to the apostolic word. 1 John 4, 6, 4, Chapter 4, verse 6, we are from God, meaning we're born of God. We're from God. We're of God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God doesn't listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's an absolutely audacious thing to say, unless you're an apostle who's speaking with confidence that your words are God's words to say, you don't listen to us, you don't have the Spirit. Because if you had the Spirit, you'd submissively hear what the apostles say. Which is one of the reasons, by the way, that you mustn't entirely give yourself over to a seeker-driven ministry. You should be sensitive to unbelievers, but if you govern what you say by what others approve, this text loses all of its meaning. Number 10, those who are born of God believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And finally, number 11. Those who are born of God overcome the world. 1 John 5, 4. Chapter 5, verse 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Eleven evidences or signs or proofs that you're born of God. Now, one of the effects on me, and I think I would be typical in this regard, of bumping into that list years ago, is to feel, even if it's not, you know, intellectually demonstrable, to feel (laughs) that's perfectionism. I mean, just that's too high. It's, It's just unrealistic. It sounds like you can't sin. And know that you have been born again. That's one effect it has. Here's the other one. It would easily lead to thinking, well, you can make a good start of it and be born again, but you may not stay born again because that's hard. And so the doctrine that you could lose your born-againness rises in your mind. Is that what's going on here? You could lose it. Now, those are two, I would think, fairly natural effects from reading that list. One, got to be perfect to know you're born again. And number two, well, I thought I was, and I think I was, but now I've lost it. Can you lose it? So what's so remarkable about John is he's, he's crystal clear about those two issues. He knows exactly that that's the effect his book has. He knows that. And he is as clear as anybody in the Bible to protect himself from those two misunderstandings. And I'll give you the key verses. First, the issue of got to be perfect. Can't sin in this church. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, that's present tense, not past tense, like, oh, yeah, I sinned once, I don't anymore. We, Noel and I met a woman like that in Munich, Germany. He said, we don't sin. I said, really? You're the first I've ever met. And, and, and she was absolutely adamant that she didn't sin. And then she went to these verses. Chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 9. Those who are born of God don't sin. I'm born of God. I don't sin. So there are people that construe this that way. John knows this. John knows this. By the way, her kid sinned. And when she didn't deal with it, she sinned. I don't know if she ever woke up to that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John's really upset with people who think they don't sin. If we confess our sins, present tense, that means ongoing action, He's faithful and just. Remember, we have an advocate. We have an advocate if anyone sins. Chapter 2, verse 2. But here, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So twice, the first one with the present tense, the last one with the perfect tense says, you, you talk about being a sinless person, you're, you're making God a liar and you are out of touch with your reality. So let's not go there. 
Let's try to understand chapter 3. We'll get there. What does he mean? Don't go on practicing sin if you're born again. And yet he says, you say you haven't sinned or don't sin. You are a liar. Walking in the light, verse 7, chapter 1, cannot mean sinlessness in view of verse 8. So what does walk in the light mean? I'll give you an advanced answer. Walking in the light means when you stumble... You recognize it. I just stumbled. There's light everywhere. Bang, you're down. If there were no, if there were no light, you might not know what was going on. Light means you can recognize the mess. Confess it. Hate it. Fix it. Move on in grace. But we'll be back to that. What about the second issue? You can lose this? I mean, is, is, are these standards, like you can make a good start, like a little baby Christian, be born again, have a little life, and later on, the standards become so high, you just throw it away, and you lose your life. You lose your salvation. Can that, can that happen? It cannot happen. At least John thinks it can't happen. And John is the clearest writer in the New Testament on this, except maybe for Paul in Romans 8, 28 to 30. Those whom he justified, he glorified. That's clear. Nobody who's justified fails to be glorified in Paul's theology. And in John, nobody who's born again fails to persevere. So it's chapter 2, verse 19. Let's read it. It's one of those great verses. Put a big something beside it for perseverance or ES for eternal security. Verse 19 of chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain. It wasn't plain before. They're just sitting in the pew, hands raised, looking like everybody else, but now it's plain. Three things John makes clear and protects us from. Number one, those who seemed to be born again forsook the faith were never born again. That's what he means when he says, they went out from us but were not of us. They weren't of us. They weren't born of God. We are of God. We thought they were of us and God. Now they have apostatized and thrown it all away and renounced his Messiahship and talk about perfectionism and have created another faith and they are not born again. They never were. The second thing he protects us from in the second half of verse 19 is to say that those who are truly born again will persevere. It's not just a negation. There's an affirmation here, verse 19, second half of the verse. If they had been of us, so if they were truly born again, they would have continued with us. When Jesus says in Mark 13, 13, those who endure to the end will be saved, he doesn't mean endurance merits salvation. He means those who have salvation show it by their endurance. That's what James, that's what John says here. If they had been of us, they would, that's perseverance, they would have persevered. Perseverance is the sign of being born again. Born again people persevere. Nobody loses his salvation. It doesn't happen. Third, When they go out and make final and decisive shipwreck of their faith, it becomes plain who they are. And that's probably why it happens. God mercifully exposes people, not always, but often, exposes the fake Christian. There's some in the room, probably. I hope these words awaken your soul so that you don't stay fake. Just 
putting on the smiley face, coming to worship and thinking you're born again when you're not born again. And eventually you're going to get tired of this religion thing, going to bail and go after the world like we've seen people do. And I just pray that my heart is the same as John's. I, I'm writing this so that you may not sin. And we have an advocate, and I wish that you would possess him because he who has the Son has life, and he's freely offering himself to you all here in this room and downtown and north. So those two problems that arose in my mind, got to be a perfect Christian to know you're born again, and goodness gracious, you can lose this thing. John says, no way. I'm not into perfectionism in this world, and I'm not into any kind of loss of salvation. God doesn't lose his children. You're in his palm. Nobody can pluck you out. I said that to a woman one time here 27 and a half years ago after my first three weeks here. And she said, yeah, but you jump out. Well, just hang in there with the new birth and you'll see. I hope you see it right there in 19. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Nobody jumps out. God keeps us. She didn't like God having that much control in her life at all. Even as a professing Christian, my life hangs on God having that much control in my life because I'm jumping out of this hand if he doesn't keep me. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh Lord, and seal it with a chain and with super glue <laughs> so that I don't bail in my low moments. That's my only hope. Now, that was a long introduction to First John, and we will end with... Uh, a page and a half of notes here out of 10 on 1 John 5. So go go to 1 John 5 with me, would you? I just want to get you ready for next time by pointing out the train of thought in verses 3 and 4, which is so remarkable. Just shows you how this works and why it is that he can say these things about newborn people. There are three links in the chain of thought in verses 3 and 4 of 1 John 5. I'll show you the links, make a comment, and we'll be done. Link number one. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So link one, loving God expresses itself in obedience, which isn't begrudging and burdensome, but joyful and free. Link number two, verse four. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That's given as an argument for link one. That's why I'm calling them links. Link number three. Second half of verse 4. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Okay. Now that's enough. Could have filled a half an hour with those. I'm going to take three minutes. Link 1 says that if you love God, it comes out as obedience to His Word, His will, and it's not burdensome. That which is... that. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So the mark of loving God, genuine love for God, is that when you read what His will is, you love it. You don't say, oh, that's burdensome. That's that's the opposite of this. Scary, right? It's because you've got to be born again. We're not playing games here. You can't make this happen. You can't make yourself like the commandments of God. God can. 
And if you don't, tonight before you go to bed, you stay up a long time facing your mattress, pleading that he would have mercy on you to change your heart. That is, to be born again. Link number two is the basis of verse three. See that little word four? For, or because, everyone who's born of God overcomes the world. So the reason the commandments of God are not burdensome for you, but rather your passion and your desire is because when you were born again, the world was defeated. Now, what what does that mean? Why does that work? It means that the, the world, which is glomming on to you as preferable to God... Go here, watch this, do this. This satisfies. World satisfies. I satisfy. I satisfy. And you know what the new birth does? Opens your eyes. You know my favorite little illustration, the necklace fondling the little brooch here in the dark. And then the light goes on. And says, yeah, it's a roach. That's what happens in the new birth. We're fondling our little roaches, our little scorpions, our little tarantulas. They're so fuzzy and warm. And the light goes on. Things look different. And Satan was telling you, will of God, really bad news. Boring. Boring! And the light goes on, and this Jesus becomes spectacularly beautiful. And to be in his band forever, that's the end of my quest. I'm done. I am home. This Jesus is all I ever wanted, and I didn't know what I wanted because the lights were out. And, of course, his will would be even when I don't understand it, what I want to try to understand and do. That's link number two. And link number three, verse four, end of the verse, this is the victory. So he's just said that if you're born again, you get victory over the world, which is glomming on to you, trying to persuade you that it's more satisfying than Jesus. This is the victory. That overcomes the world, your faith. So the new birth, the beginning of God is the, is the victory, and faith is the victory. Sound familiar for three weeks? These never are separated. And, and the way faith figures in is that it's the conscious experience of the lights going on, Jesus becoming compelling instead of foolish, and being embraced for all God is for us in him. That's faith. That's what faith is like. When you're born again, simultaneous, eyes go open. First thing you see is Jesus in the gospel, irresistibly compelling, and you embrace him as your best friend, highest treasure, Savior, Lord, everything he is you want him to be for you. And consciously, that's how the power of the world is broken. That is the key to life. The way to fight the allurement of internet porn or money or esteem in the guild is to just pray, God, keep my eyes open. Keep my eyes open. I'm out of here within a vapor's breath of life. I just want to know you. I got to see you. I got to keep you clear because if you aren't clear, I'm suckered into this world. God, confirm my new birth every day with eyes. That's the way Paul prays in Ephesians 1.17. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened that you may know the hope of your calling. Why would he pray that for Christians? Because we tend not to remember the hope of our calling enough so we go after the hope of money. So, may God, this is my closing sentence, may God confirm Confirm the new birth of thousands of people at Bethlehem. 
through faith in His Son and loving each other. That's the summary, faith and love. There's so much more to see, so much more to say, but let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for 1 John. I love John. I love 1 John. I love you for inspiring John to write this for us, to help us, to to guard us against stupidity and error and leaping off the fence on either of the wrong sides. Oh God, would you grant now at the North Campus, downtown, right here, right now, by your Spirit, that eyes would be opened to see the glory of our Savior. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's our only hope because we sin every day. Have mercy upon us as a church to keep us humble, take away all cockiness, all arrogance, And may we be like little children, beggars, commending our Savior to others who are beggars. We're in a war. Make us, I pray, valiant. Am I a soldier of the cross, follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? 